Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this first Sunday in the season of Advent comes from the third chapter of the first book of Moses, commonly called Genesis, verses 14 through to 15. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. This prophecy of the birth of Jesus is known as the Proto-Evangelium, or the First Gospel, as this is the very first promise of the Messiah. This understanding of the text is not unique to Christianity. Even the Jews understood this passage as a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. In the 3rd century BC, in the Septuagint, or Greek translation of the Pentateuch, or Five Books of Moses, the Oculus Targum, which was essentially a Bible translation plus explanations, somewhat similar to a modern-day study Bible, identified the seed of the woman with the coming Messiah, the serpent with Satan, and the crushing of the head of the serpent as the Messiah King's victory over Satan. This passage begins with a curse on the serpent, that he shall go about on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. Now many scholars believe that pre-fall snakes had legs, and that from this point on snakes would be legless. However, H.C. Leopold in his exposition on Genesis argues that this might not necessarily be the case. He points out how man's curse was to work by the sweat of his brow, and that the woman's curse would that there would be increased labour pains in birth. However, man did work before the fall, and woman was created to give birth prior to the fall. Plus, God says, I will increase your labour pains in birth, suggesting that there would have been some form of pain associated with childbirth pre-fall. Thus, Leopold points out that man and woman continue to do the same things post-fall that they did pre-fall, just under the added burden of the curse. Thus, argued Leopold, it is likely that snakes always slithered on the ground pre-fall, but that now this would be seen as a curse and as a burden, rather than as part of God's good and glorious creation. Now some will ask, since it was Satan that sinned, then why are all snakes punished? Luther states in his Genesis commentary, that Satan did not take on the form of a serpent, but demonically possessed a literal snake. John Safati of Creation Ministry Internationals in his Genesis account proposes the same opinion. And thus people will ask, why is the snake punished for Satan's sin? And Luther declared, as in the flood also animals were destroyed because of man's sin, so also the serpent was punished on account of the devil which had misused it. The church father John Chrysostom commented on this passage saying, Just as a loving father, when punishing the murderer of his son, might snap the sword in two with which the murderer, which with the murder has been committed. Thus, the snake as the instrument or weapon wielded by Satan is broken. The snake's punishment is twofold, crawling on his belly and eating dust. Though both expressions refer to the same subjugation and humiliation of the serpent. In Micah 7.17, the nations, this is the enemies of God, are put to shame and made to lick the dust like the serpent. Many have raised questions then about the serpent eating dust, since it is worms and not snakes that eat dirt. As Leopold said in his exposition, snakes don't eat dirt. Now many scholars have attempted to address this problem. Safati, in his Genesis account, attempts to use a scientific argument about how snakes do in fact ingest dirt. 
He explained that snakes have a special organ that allows them to smell but only through physical contact. Thus snakes will use their tongue to lick up pieces of dirt and carry that dirt into their mouth to then be smelt. However, this sounds a lot like a trying to square a trying to get a square peg to fit into a round hole. Most scholars, however, simply offer for a much simpler explanation, and that is that the eating of dust is more symbolic rather than literal. Scholars argue that the phrase eat the dust is a parallel term to lick the dust, used in passages such as Micah 7.17, Isaiah 49.23, and Psalm, 20, uh, Psalm 72, 9, which means to be humiliated and brought into submission. The phrase, eat the dust or lick the dust, has in its mind the image of having your face pushed down into the dirt, generally with your enemy's head, with your enemy's foot on your head pushing it down into the dirt in order to demonstrate their complete domination over you. The argument that eat the dust is parallel to the phrase lick the dust can be seen in Micah 7.17 where the enemies of God are said to lick the dust like the serpent and the other crawling creatures. Thus, it is not a literal eating of dirt as a meal but more of a sign of humiliation that you are forced to crawl around on the ground and eat your food from the dirty dirt, from the dirty ground. As Paul Kretzmann wrote in his popular commentary of the Bible, the snake eats dirt because he eats what is found on the ground, which is then covered in dirt. Now some have suggested that since Adam is made of dust, the phrase eat the dust is meant to refer to Satan's attack on man. However, in Isaiah 65, 25, when describing the new heavens and the new earth, the serpent is said to still be eating dust. At this point in time, the, certain, the serpent, that is Satan, is defeated and cast into the lake of fire, and thus he is unable to attack Adam. Instead, Satan is eating dust in the sense that he is completely defeated and humiliated. Kretzmann wrote that his punishment of the snake serves as symbolic punishment for Satan. And Gerhard von Rad in his commentary on Genesis wrote that this passage reflects quite realistically man's ongoing struggle with snakes. However, the meaning of this text goes beyond the pure zoological and at the same time speaks about the ongoing spiritual conflict between the church and Satan. The snake's subjugation and eating of dust is a representation of what the Lord does to Satan. After the fall, the devil is humiliated and made to crawl around in the dirt. He is no longer the beautiful guardian cherub. He is no longer Lucifer, the light bearer. Now he is the devil, the evil one, the accuser. He will be made to crawl around in humiliation. And like any snake, he will strike at the legs of man. God declares that there will be enmity between the serpent and the woman, between his seed and her seed. The serpent is Satan, and his seed are not only the demons that follow him, but also all unbelievers. For, John, for Jesus says in John 8.44 that the unbelievers are sons of Satan. As for the woman and her seed, as for the woman and her seed, this has a twofold meaning, one in the singular and one in the collective. See, in verse 15, the Hebrew word used for seed is zarah. This word can be used either singularly or collectively, very much similar to the English words fish or sheep. You have one sheep. Or you have a group of sheep. You do not have sheep. Thus, in the same way, Zerah can be used as one Zerah or many Zerah. The serpent's Zerah is multiple. The, this would imply that the woman's seed would also be multiple. Yet, in the second half of the sentence, the woman's Zerah is referred to as he and his in the singular. 
So is the desire of the woman a singular or a plural? And the answer can actually be both. See, the woman and her seed, or Zerah, is clearly the prophecy of the Virgin Mary and the Messiah. In Revelation 12, we read of the woman giving birth to a man, the Messiah. The woman in Revelation 12 here represents both Mary and the church as a whole. In Galatians 4.26, the church is called our mother. Thus, the enmity between the serpent and the woman is really a, a enmity between Satan and the church. Additionally, there is enmity between the unbelievers and Christ and between Satan and Christ. Through baptism, the believer is made one with Christ through the mystical union. Thus, enmity with Christ, the, sing, the seed singular, is also enmity with all believers the seed plural. Thus, there will be an ongoing enmity between the forces of the serpent and the forces of the seed. But God gives the promise that the seed of the woman would come and that he would crush the head of the serpent, but that his own heel would be struck. This happened in the crucifixion, when Christ defeated the serpent by dying for our sins. The serpent was defeated, but Christ was wounded. Yet even though he was wounded, he rose from the dead. And as I mentioned above, the idea that this text speaks of the coming Messiah is not limited to the New Testament Christians, but was something also believed by the Old Testament saints as well. This was the very first promise of the Messiah. The Old Testament saints is not The Old Testament saints put their faith in the promised seed and through faith in this seed they were justified. With that in mind, let us ask, how much did Adam and Eve know about this coming Messiah? As Luther comments in his Genesis commentary, as Luther comments in his Genesis commentary, in order to mock the tempter, God does not announce, to the announce who the woman will be that will give birth to this Messiah, meaning that Satan would be suspicious of all women. Of course, as time went by, God would slowly reveal to us more information about the Messiah and his mother. We would learn that the Messiah would come from the line of Seth, from the line of Noah, from the line of Shem, from the line of Abraham, from the line of Isaac, of Jacob, and of Judah, and finally from the line of King David. We later learn that he would be connected with the king line as the rightful heir to the king of the Jews. We learn from Isaiah that his mother would be a virgin, and finally Gabriel reveals to Mary that she would be this chosen virgin. But how much did Adam and Eve originally know? And what knowledge were they able to pass on to their children? Firstly, we know that the Messiah would be human, since he is to be born of the woman. Since there is no mention of a him being con since there is no mention of him being conceived by a man, one could imply that this also foretells the virgin birth. However, as we will discuss in but a moment, Eve thought that her firstborn son Cain was the Messiah, and thus this demonstrates to us that Adam and Eve were not yet aware of the virgin birth. Next, we know that the Messiah would defeat the devil because he would crush the serpent's head. We also know that the Messiah would suffer because the serpent would strike his heel. But this suffering would not lead to the ultimate destruction of the Messiah. One thing that we can learn from Genesis is all that we can one thing that we also can learn from the book of Genesis is that the Messiah would be divine and that he would be God incarnate. Now one will ask, how can we do that? It doesn't say anything about that in this text from Genesis 3. And that is true. 
Genesis 3, 14 to 15 does not say anything about the Messiah being divine. But we can see this in Genesis 4, 1. In Genesis 4, 1, Eve gives birth to Cain and she says, I have begotten a man with the help of the Lord. However, that's only what you'll find in your modern English Bibles, and it's actually incorrect. If you read the literal Hebrew, the text says, I have begotten a man, the Lord, or literally, Yahweh. Hence, the actual meaning of the text is, I have, be I have begotten a man who is the Lord. I have begotten a man who is Yahweh. And Luther argues in his Genesis commentary that Eve believed that Cain, her firstborn son, was, a was the Messiah. Luther argues this on the point that she does not call him a son, but a man. Or as Luther would say, the man. The promised man. The promised Messiah. Thus, Luther and many scholars before and after him believe that Eve had made a mistake and believed that Cain, the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, the seed of the woman, is the Messiah. Thus, Adam and Eve believed that Cain was the Messiah, and Luther held that this is what led to Cain's own pride and his downfall. What we can most learn from this mistake of Eve is that Eve believed Cain was the Messiah, and not just this, that she believed Cain was Yahweh in the flesh. This shows us that Adam and Eve believed that the Messiah would be God in the flesh. Thus, even though Genesis 3 does not explicitly say the Messiah will be divine, Adam and Eve were somehow able to deduce from this promise from God that the Messiah would be both man and God, that the Messiah would be God in human flesh. How they came to such a conclusion, we will never know for sure. But Adam and Eve were created perfect and were both would have been excellent theologians. Thus, it is possible that they were able to determine things that were only implied about the Messiah. Although, they weren't able to determine that the Messiah would be born of the Virgin, since they believed that Cain, conceived of a man and a woman, was the Messiah. Now, there are a number of things that can be deduced from Genesis 3, 14 to 15 with the help of the rest of the Holy Scriptures. One is that the Messiah would have to die. Adam and Eve understood that the Messiah would rescue them from the devil. Thus, they would have to conclude that this meant the Messiah would make atonement for their sins. And after God had proclaimed the curse upon the serpent on Eve and on Adam, he then covered the, the sin of Adam and Eve by killing an animal and making for them clothing. Adam and Eve from this could have concluded that in order to atone for sins, there has to be a shedding of blood. Thus, if the Messiah was going to atone for their sins, he too would have to die and shed his blood. However, they also knew from Genesis 3.15 that the Messiah would only be wounded by the serpent. Thus, they could have concluded that the Messiah would suffer and die for their sins, but that this death would not be permanent. From there, they could have concluded that the Messiah would rise from the dead, and that if it was possible for him to rise from the dead, he would have to be divine. There is also the simpler idea that they just... There is also the simpler idea that Adam and Eve simply believed that since the Messiah would come and defeat the serpent and atone for their sins, the only one capable of doing this would have to be God himself. Thus they would conclude that the Messiah would have to be God in flesh in order to defeat the serpent because no mere man could do it. However, Adam and Eve came up with this conclusion. Genesis 4.1 tells us that they believed the Messiah would be God in the flesh. And Genesis 4.26, 
also tells us that after the death of Abel and the birth of Seth, that people began to call on the name of the Lord. Paul tells us in Romans 10, 13, that all who call on the name of the Lord Paul tells us in Romans 10.13 that all who called on the name of the Lord were calling on the name of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. After Cain killed Abel and people realized that he was not the Messiah, they began to call on the true Messiah, the coming seed of the woman. And all Old Testament saints looked forward to the birth of this Messiah, the, ser the seed of the woman the Lord in human flesh, trusting and believing that one day he would come to crush the head of the serpent. And roughly 4,000 years after the creation, the seed did come, born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem. At the age of 32, Jesus Christ was then nailed to the cross where he crushed the head of the serpent by making atonement for our sins and removing from the devil his ability to accuse us. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We now sing our next hymn, number seven.